The question I want to pose is, are we here by chance? When we look into our Bibles, in the very first chapter and the very first verse in Genesis, we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the following verses give us more detail about that creation, right up to the creation of human beings. But many people today would say we've learned so much about the world we live in and about the universe in general, we no longer have to attribute that to God or a God. We can work it all out step by step and it all arose as a result of natural causes randomly occurring over long periods of time. Some scientists, and of course that well-known atheist Richard Dawkins, emphatically assert that this is the way the universe, the earth, and life in general evolved. So the question before us becomes, did God create us, or are we just simply a lucky accident? Well, of course, even with all our knowledge today, we don't know everything by a long shot. Our knowledge is incomplete, and many of the things that we think we understand in science are probably wrong. And because we don't have sufficient data, we can't be sure. But working on what we do have and what we do understand, what are the basic steps needed to produce the universe, the world, and life as we know it, and as we see it here today? What's the recipe or the prescription for a universe? The conditions that must be in place, without any one of which we probably would not be here. We must start with a singularity, and no one knows quite what that is. We can't get one in a laboratory and pull it apart. We can't manufacture one, but According to the current theory, a singularity is an infinitely small object having no dimensions, but is infinitely dense, and it's a place where there is no time, no space, and the laws of physics as we understand them simply don't apply. So it's a very peculiar object, but that's what we believe the universe started with. And then next, there had to be a creation event, what science refers to as the Big Bang. For no reason known to science, that singularity I mentioned rapidly expanded, very rapidly. In the first second, uh, for a time, it expanded faster than the speed of light. It was intensely hot trillions of degrees hot, and gradually it slowed down and cooled down. But the expansion, of course, continued. So we don't know how the singularity came to be, we don't really know what it was, and we don't know why it exploded or expanded into a, a universe in creation. But we do know that the rate of expansion and the rate of cooling had to be just at the right speed. If it was too fast or too slow, we wouldn't have ended up perhaps with a universe at all, or at least the universe we have 13.8 billion years later. And then the four natural forces would have been created at the time this all occurred. One we're all familiar with, the force of gravity, would have made its first appearance. And the others are the electromagnetic force that governs electricity and magnetism and light, the strong nuclear force that binds the nucleus of an atom together, 
and the weak nuclear force that relates to uh, electrons within the atom. All of these had to come into play and all of them had to be at precisely the right strength and operating within the right parameters. Otherwise, matter wouldn't have formed and we simply wouldn't have been here. As things cooled, and Einstein's famous formula, E equals mc squared, came into play, all this energy of expansion and heat that was now in the universe commenced to be converted, at least in part, into protons, neutrons and electrons, matter as we understand it, as well as antimatter being their opposite counterparts. So the universe now is a lot of heat, a lot of energy, and matter is making its first appearance. There had to be more matter than antimatter because when antimatter meets matter, the two annihilate and all that's left is back to energy again. So as we live in a today in a, in a universe that has matter and very little, if any, antimatter, there had to be a surplus of matter over antimatter at the start, and we don't know why or how that came to be. And then two-thirds of the age of the universe elapses, nine billion years. And nine billion years after the Big Bang, not for the first time because this happened many times, a huge cloud or nebula of gas and dust for some reason began to spin and contract as it span. Probably it collided with another similar cloud or an exploding star disturbed it. And as it travelled through space at high speed, spinning all the way, part of the content of the cloud contracted into a clump in the middle that became denser and denser as it got smaller and smaller. And eventually so dense, nuclear reactions started to take place in the hydrogen of which it was largely composed and a star was born. Smaller clumps orbited from the same cloud, orbited the, the new star, but they were not sufficiently big enough to light any nuclear fires, and as a consequence, remained just balls of gas and dust contracting and eventually assuming a spherical shape. These were the planets and the moons and all the other contents of the solar system. Most stars, or at least half the stars and probably the majority of stars in the universe as we know it, are double or multiple stars. We were fortunate that with the choice of our sun, it was a solitary one because had we been a planet orbiting two or more stars and being subjected at varying intervals to multiple starlight and then perhaps only one or none, the climate change would have been horrific. So we were lucky to end up with just the sun. But the sun had to be just more than a solitary star. It had to be long lived Many stars only last uh, a few million years and that, as we know, isn't long enough to produce the world we live in today. And then again, not only has the star got to be long-lived, it's got to be very, very constant in its light and heat output. Otherwise, again, we wouldn't be able to withstand the variations in climate. And then, of course, there have to be planets around the star, and as our recent uh, exploration of stars near the Earth 
reveals, it seems most stars have a family of planets. But not many have a planet that duplicates in any sense the planet we live on. There are always some variations that would make their planets dissimilar from ours. And this planet, the Earth, has to be at just the right distance from the sun to be neither too hot nor too cold, what's often referred to as the Goldilocks zone. We look at our own solar system and we see Venus, which is 70% of the distance we are from the sun, and yet it's far too hot with a surface temperature of about 450 degrees. We look at the other planet that's closest to us, beyond us, Mars, and it's about one and a half times further out than we are, and it's far too cold. And then our orbit round this star, this sun, has to be nearly circular. Orbits are never exactly circular, not in nature. They're always elliptical. But an elliptical orbit can be almost circular or nowhere near circular. And if we were in the latter sort of orbit, as some planets are, Pluto, for example, in our own solar system, when it was a planet, was in a highly elliptical orbit. It would mean that for half our year, we would be close to the sun, for the other half, perhaps twice as far away. And again, that would have a devastating effect on climate. Our planet has to rotate. It rotates, of course, once every 24 hours. If it didn't rotate, as fast as that, and Venus takes over 220 odd days to rotate once on its axis. If it rotated as slowly as that, it would mean that the sun would bear down on parts of the planet for many, many days and weeks without break, and the rest would be left in darkness, again having a devastating effect on climate. If it rotated too fast, within a matter of a few hours, the effect on our atmosphere, the winds that were generated and the currents in the ocean would be equally devastating. The axis of our planet is tilted, 23 and a half degrees, and this provides for us our seasons, summer and winter and so on, both in northern and southern hemispheres. If we didn't have that, we would have an eternal summer in the equatorial and tropical regions. We would have much greater ice caps north and south, and probably much of the planet would be uninhabitable. We need a large moon to stabilise our orbit. Our orbit, of course, is largely controlled by the gravitational influence of the, of the sun. But the other planets, particularly the big ones like Jupiter and Saturn, also have an effect on our orbit and give us a much gentler tug, but sufficiently uh, to disturb over long periods of time. The nice circular orbit that we almost have at the moment, as well as the tilt of our axis. And again, those gravitational influences affect our climate. Perhaps the ice ages that we know we've experienced in the past have been due to this. Our planet has to have the right mass, the right amount of material in it to exert at its surface the right gravitational force. If it were too large, as many planets are, particularly those that have been recently discovered around other stars, we would probably not have the atmosphere we have. It would be probably an atmosphere rich in hydrogen and helium, the original atmosphere and material out of which the Earth formed. If, like the Moon, for example, it had much less mass and gravity, 
the probability is it would have no atmosphere at all, or if it started out with one, it would eventually leak off into space because of the lack of attraction keeping it on the Earth. And then we have in our solar system a number of large outer planets, much bigger than the Earth, and which have the effect of deflecting incoming material that might otherwise collide with the Earth. Comets and asteroids and meteoroids that could cause immense damage to life on the Earth. We know these collisions have taken place in the past. We can still see in some places, even in Australia, some of the substantial craters uh, caused by these impacts. So we do rely to some degree on this protection. In 1997, astronomers witnessed a comet attracted by Jupiter on its way in towards the Sun and Jupiter's gravitational forces tore the comet apart into about 20 pieces, all of which subsequently crashed into Jupiter. And we were able to observe the enormous impacts that there took place because these objects are travelling when they hit at speeds of the order of between 50 and perhaps even 200,000 kilometres an hour. Our planet has to have water. That's basic. We're even now looking to see how much water Mars, for example, had on it. And by water, I mean liquid water, not ice or steam. So it, by definition, has to be in an environment between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius. That is a very narrow range indeed when you consider the temperatures in the universe range from absolute zero at minus 273 degrees up to trillions of degrees uh, at the other end. But without water existing as a liquid, we are not going to have life. We're not going to be able to remove carbon dioxide from our atmosphere or stabilise temperature and climate or provide, as we'll see in a moment, a habitat for early life forms. And then our planet has to have a liquid iron and nickel core, as indeed it does have. Actually, its inner core, under the pressures at the centre, is solid. But it is surrounded by the same material, nickel and iron, in liquid form as the pressures decline as you head towards the surface. So that when the planet rotates once a day, the core, the solid part of the core, also rotates in this liquid shell. And that has a similar effect to a, a dynamo or generator. It produces a magnetic field around the planet, the thing that makes your compass work. But perhaps more importantly, it provides a protective shield around the Earth against harmful cosmic radiation, both from the sun and from other objects in deep space. Without that protection, life simply could not have formed. And then again, on this planet, unlike any other in the solar system, we have what we call plate tectonics. Our continents don't stay in the same place. If you like, they're like the scum that might gather on top of a uh, saucepan full of boiling water. Driven by convection, and that's exactly what's happening within the Earth, these continental plates drift around very slowly, perhaps in human terms, but enough over thousands or millions of years to completely alter the map of the globe and also alter the positions of oceans and currents and climates 
on the, on the globe. And one other f interesting feature of this uh, uh, phenomenon is that it operates to lock away a lot of excess carbon because the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere that we are so worried about in regard to climate change eventually dissolves in the oceans, at least in part. And when it's taken in that form into the oceans, it can be converted into other solids, even the outer structures and uh, shells of marine creatures, eventually being locked up in either that form, in limestones, on the bottom of the ocean bed, and when the plates, the continental plates, move around, this material very often gets shifted down into the hotter, deeper parts of the earth, what we call the mantle. Well then, for reasons again that science can't explain, life emerges on this new planet. And that occurs about a billion years after its formation. The life that does emerge is characterised, as indeed all life is today, by a molecule that we refer to as DNA, and most people have heard of that. But it's a very complex and unusual molecule, and one that is hard to believe formed itself simply by a happy coincidence or chance. But life in very basic forms did emerge about a billion years after the Earth appeared. Single cell life, bacterial life, algae, uh, all began round about this time. Not on the land, because the land couldn't support life. The ultraviolet radiation, particularly the more powerful uh, radiation in that spec part of the spectrum, from the sun would have prevented life from forming. So life emerged not on the land but in the oceans. And it blossomed there for another three billion years. It also changed the Earth's atmosphere. Up to that point in time, the Earth's atmosphere consisted largely of nitrogen and carbon dioxide and a few other gases in smaller quantities. Much of the carbon dioxide became dissolved in the oceans, but it still left plenty. And of course, the plant life and the other life present in the oceans, using a process known as photosynthesis, the sunlight that filtered down through the water, without, of course, the harmful UV radiation, was absorbed by the plant and other life, the carbon in particular being used for the construction of the, the cells within that life, but the oxygen being expelled as waste material. Over three billion years or so, that oxygen level in the oceans or from the oceans and into the atmosphere, built up, producing a level of oxygen similar to what we have today. Oxygen normally exists in molecules of two oxygen atoms, but sometimes it gets around as three atoms, which we call ozone. And these atoms, or molecules I should say, these molecules operate to exclude the higher energy UV radiation. So as our atmosphere developed an ozone layer, after four billion years all told, the dry land became a place where life could survive and multiply. So life emerged from the oceans about five 
or 600,000 years ago. Five or 600 million years ago and started to evolve upon the land ultimately as we see it today. There had also to be one further condition. During this period, particularly whilst land was being utilised as a habitat for life, the planet had to be free from any devastating life extinguishing events. Events like collisions with large asteroids or the presence of super volcanoes uh, erupting and altering the climate. In fact, events of this nature did occur during this period and many of them are thought to be the separation points between the various geological ages when many life forms disappear and then subsequently new ones emerge. It was probably an asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. But it didn't just take the dinosaurs, it took many other forms of life as well. And incidentally, allowed new forms like mammals uh, and ultimately us to develop. Perhaps we wouldn't be here were it not for that particular asteroid. And then one last condition, there has to be sufficient time for all this to happen. And in our case, and our case is the only one we have to look at, it took altogether from the point where the Earth started to form, it took 4.6 billion years. Now, I've just run through some 29 in all, 29 conditions that have to be gone through to reach where we are at the present stage. If you remove any one of those items or assign to them different values or strengths or frequencies, as the case may be, you end up with a universe and an Earth, if in fact they exist at all, vastly different and probably not habitable, as far as the Earth is concerned, for life. We know we have something like 200 billion stars and probably each of them has planets of one sort or another, in our Milky Way galaxy. But as far as we know, there is no other just like Earth, and probably in view of the large number of conditions that have to be present, none other that can bring together all of those 29, plus any others we haven't yet thought of or become aware of, all of those conditions together to constitute what we know as life on this planet today. So getting back to our start, our question, are we here by chance? What's the likelihood of all these factors coming together, as Richard Dawkins would argue, by natural events, natural processes occurring at random? If we were to give each of these uh, conditions a 10% chance of being present, arbitrary, but not unreasonable, some are, some are like, more likely than 10%, some are less likely, but if we assigned that kind of chance to each single one of them, we'd end up, when we put it all together to see how, how our chances would be for all 29, with one followed by 29 zeros. An enormous number, exceeding by far the estimated number of stars in the entire universe. We don't know what the individual chances are of most of these factors occurring, 
But what we do know is the chances are obviously going to be extremely remote uh, if we have to rely upon natural processes. So I think it's almost inevitable. The answer to our question is, are we here by chance? No, we are not. And if we're not here by chance, it seems to me we must be here as the product of intentional design. And if so, there has to be a designer. And this surely is very strong external evidence for the presence of God as that designer and creator. Of course, we don't need this, many of us, to prove that God is there. We know God exists because we talk to him. We know that he acts within our lives. We pray to him. He answers our prayers. The presence of his Holy Spirit in our daily lives is a given and without which our lives in any event would be vastly different. But here, in the processes I've described and the conclusion I've reached is, if you like, external evidence unsupported by any theological basis, but external evidence based purely on our observation of the physical world. I think we can again return to the Bible, this time the Psalms, Psalm 19, and readily affirm as true the first verse of that Psalm. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. <laughs>